yeah the one more thing i guess i'm famous for that one yeah. more that will if you ask will asher if he, if if you say my name that's probably what he will think of one more i'm a bit of a perfectionist and and there's times where i already have the shot i don't tell the people but there was one time uh, shooting for uh, radar and uh uh can't remember who the skier was but i kept kept going kept going and then after that trent went goes out and first first turn i'm like okay i got it stopped <laughs> and trent's like looked at this other skiers like see that's how you do it but it's happened before but you know but i have them just to be sure maybe yeah. maybe i can get something better <laughs> all right everyone welcome to the episode number 19 of the water ski podcast this is matteo and uh yeah welcome to the podcast if this is your first episode i hope you enjoy the whole purpose behind this which is to grow the sport primarily through the voices of uh, some of the people in the sport. So this episode is with Thomas Gustafsson, who is a Swedish skier, a uh, very um, long-time coach. Uh, he has been coaching in Italy primarily, but also around the world. And especially, he's pretty much considered one of the best uh, water sports, toad sports industry photographers ever. So... It was super cool to sit down with him and pick his brain on, you know, anything photography related. Like Thomas shared some stories, uh, gave some advice, uh, talks about some of the shots that he did and some of the challenges, uh, some of the things he learned along the way. And um, since this was about photography and a lot of you guys said you wanted another contest, we decided to do another uh, Apple podcast review contest. So basically... If you want to participate, you go on Apple Podcast, you leave a review, but it has to be a review about Thomas's episode. Uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, some of the things you took away from it. And uh, make sure before you hit submit to send me a screenshot of your review so that I know who you are. So you can send that screenshot uh, before you hit submit to Matteo, M-A-T-T-E-O, at thewaterskipodcast.com. And uh, in about a week's time, we'll do another Instagram live akin to what we did with CP and uh, raffle the winner. And the winner will win a print of one of Thomas's shots autographed by him. Shipped to your home that you can frame and put at ski school, put at your club or maybe put at your house, you know. So stay tuned. You can find some more details about this contest on the show notes, but essentially... Follow me on Lutzgram, sorry, follow me on Instagram at Lutzgram, L-U-Z-Z-G-R-A-M. And uh, in about a week's time, we'll do a raffle and uh, we'll see who wins this print by Thomas, signed by Thomas. And um, yeah, other than that, enjoy the episode. I think this was a very cool episode. Enjoy and um, see you for the next one. Buona. Shall we? Ciao, Matteo. Ciao, Thomas. How are you doing? I'm good. Well, thank you for sitting down with me. Huh? Oh, I'm uh, I'm honored. Wow, that's for sure. I'm honored. Now it should be a good conversation, you know? I hope so. Well, I mean, we all have a story, I guess. We all do. We all do. And I think yours is a very interesting one. Oh, thank you. Um, so why don't we start by getting to see how you get, got into skiing? Like, how did you get exposed to the sport? Uh, it was through my, <clears throat> excuse me, it was through my dad. He had a friend who, he was actually the team captain for the Swedish team. And his son was skiing and he basically said, come out. And so I tried. And uh, when I was there, he was like, you know, if you, if you have to be good, you have to ski four or five times a day. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. And I snow skied on a competitive level ice hockey and soccer so the training part you know it wasn't strange to me 
Yeah. And uh, after that, I went to stay with them for a week and I started skiing four or five times a day and I haven't really slowed down well I have now but right. you know and that's how it started what age um I was pretty old I was uh, 11 I think oh, I was, okay oh, I was gonna turn 12 that summer oh okay and, a little uh, later on yeah 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 and uh yeah was this far from your hometown yeah about um almost an hour okay almost an hour and I actually <laughs> can't remember if it was that summer or if it was the summer afterwards um where we came and and you know they they kind of went ahead of me and my mom she kind of got upset because we drove that far and then we had to wait and they made me wait so we we changed club oh yeah. okay okay but oh well this is kind of a neat story because i remember once coming there um from the road seeing someone skiing and then someone did a 360 off the wake i was like whoa that's so cool and this was anita carman and she was she she later won u.s masters and she got second world's tricking and oh, wow she was kind of my idol and i looked up to her and uh, went skiing with her in america because she dated my case would also so i i uh, yeah yeah i got off a good start some you know good people yeah so it might have started a little late but certainly the inspiration and the influence was oh, there for sure for sure and um how was your progression because you said you were playing other sports <laughs> obviously you were competitive snow skier what did you progress fast through the, you know, all the hurdles of the sport? Well, slalom has never been my event. Mm -hmm. Firstly, because I'm short, but I never really liked it. Tricking was my thing. I really liked the building, learning new tricks. I didn't mind falling. And uh, once I changed ski club, there was a, this club was probably the best ski club in Sweden with uh, the best skiers in Sweden and they had a driver who took me under his wings mm -hmm. and um, he taught me so much in tricks I, I mean I learned so much trick skiing and I actually that second year I didn't I didn't I never slumped so oh, okay that's interesting yeah and that's uncommon like you don't generally equate, you know, Scandinavian skiers with good trickers, at least not nowadays, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, no, of course. I mean, we had Mike and Helena Schellander and we've had some, we had some good slalom skiers actually in the past, some under 21 European champions, Matthias yeah. Lundberg, a guy, and also his sister, Cecilia Lundberg. They're yeah. very good slalom skiers. You know, yeah, generally, you know, I'm, I mean, in my limited career, I think of like Sweden as like slalom and jump, yeah. right? Uh, even more so just because of the weather. You said you don't mind falling, but it gets colder quicker than in the rest of Europe. So, you know, falling yeah, starts to be I a little mean, cold. Yeah, I mean, I've done my fair share of skiing in the cold. The latest I've skied in Sweden was December 4th. And I mean, we had the socks on our feet i had bigger bindings just so i could have my feet in there right you know the the head thing gloves or dishwashing gloves mm -hmm. and uh, i had a uh, at that time a guy who i trained with all the time who was a very good skier also jonas Kalmark, who actually won a lot of european titles as a dolphin and junior mm -hmm. since i started late i never really medaled my i think i got fifth in jump in actually in in italy in Cervia. oh in, no way i think it was 82 or 83 yeah oh wow D so, did you enjoy jumping yeah i mean that was yeah i liked it yeah so were you did you go in your career through the the change like of the biggest keys were you still jumping at the time <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's funny. So, I mean, 72s were big and there was one time, well, you know, Mike Schellander, he had 74s mm -hmm. and that was like huge. And I, 
you know, I, I decided to buy 73s and I mean, and I was a small guy. Right. Uh, but then later when it was Exocet, they came out with jump skis. I had a pair of 78s and, but I didn't jump that much on them. Okay. And, and I never used the speed suit until very late and a few times. And, uh, I had a few big jumps, not because of the speed suit, but you couldn't, uh, you can tie your arms, you know, after you jump, you kind of retie your arm sling yeah. after each jump, but with right. the speed suit, you couldn't do it. And, uh, so it got a little looser, but that made my arms straighter. And so it's something that I learned too late because yeah. I was always coming into the jump with my arms a little bent. Right. So it's kind of funny how how you learn things from differences in equipment that you can't even control. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's but, cool. Um, and then, um, what are some of your fondest memory in terms of like competing at a tournament? You know, it doesn't have to be a big score or anything like that, although it probably will be, but just some good memories you have from skiing tournaments. Well, one of the, so, as you know, I, I worked in Italy since 91, um, coaching, working as coach. And uh, that whole summer, you know, I now I don't have much hair on my head. I didn't have much then either. But, okay. you know, blonde guy from Sweden, everybody kind of quickly knew who I was. Right. And that year, Worlds were in Austria. Mm -hmm. And so it's right. It was very close to Italy and a lot of Italians went there to look and uh, I made the jump finals. Oh, in Villac? Yeah. Oh, so man. I, I made the jump finals and it was, it was, it was super cool because, you know, there's a lot of people from Italy who knew me and, and just egging me on. Like, you know, it was, it's very cool. And then after that, there was um, the Italian masters mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Marco Merlo's memory, yeah. one of Italy's greatest skier who died in an airplane crash. Yeah. And so they had the Italian masters in uh, uh, Castel Gandolfo outside of Rome. And we got to meet the mayor of Rome, who was a skier at that time also, or skied. Yeah. And then we also got to meet the Pope. Yeah. And so that... I mean, I, I have pictures of that. So that's that's huge. That's kind of cool. Very yeah. cool, actually. Yeah, no, those were like the, the golden years of water skiing, right? Yeah. And and actually, that, that tournament, I set my PB in jump. And uh, yeah, I got fifth. I mean, er, most of the skiers from Worlds came down, you know, and uh, it was just cool. It was very cool. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, no, I, and I've heard great things about Castel Gandolfo, yeah. like this uh, natural lake yeah. next to the, the I Papa mean, I, residence. I, I think they shut it down after that, maybe. I don't know. But you can't ski anymore. Yeah, no, not too long after that. Yeah, you couldn't ski there anymore. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Sweet. So, no, yeah, I bet that's a good memory. Yeah. No, it's good. And then uh, maybe we had a jump tournament in Sweden called Sola Masters, which was really famous also for a while. Mm -hmm. It was it was kind of like a Moomba right in a canal and uh, got third there and yeah it's cool Spanish masters very cool also night night jumping and night finals what they, about uh Estada magic um and see like an hour it's in north of Barcelona okay very very cool tournament I mean, the finals started maybe midnight. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's crazy. It is so cool. And I mean, today they, they, they night jump. We had a lot of lights. But now, I mean, I've seen night jumping. I remember in Milan, like with one spotlight. I'm, I don't know how they do it, but yeah. it, was, it was weird. It was, it, but it was cool. So many people. So many people. Yeah, it was different, different experience to ski in those tournaments, yeah. wasn't it? I mean, I... Yeah, I, I had never skied the Pro Tour. I tried to qualify, but, you know, as I, I managed, 175 was the limit, then they raised the bar. And so I, that's what I wanted to. But, uh, yeah, I did the European Tour a little bit. And yeah. It was good fun. 
Yeah, no, I bet. I mean, it sounds like it, you know, like jumping in front of like hundreds of people, you know. I mean, if you... Sola Masters, that was a big crowd. I, I'll show you a video later, but uh, I think I posted something on my Instagram and it's a uh, very cool, very nice. cool tournament. A lot of people, because it's right in the city, just like Mumba. Yeah. So, Did you ski Mumba ever? No, never. Been out there? I've been there. Okay. In 2000 nine because in uh, <clears throat> in 89 uh, so i i worked at a ski school benso ski center mm -hmm. and i met some australians andrew and grant barnett grant is the team captain for the australian team now okay and so we got became good friends and they wanted me to come to ski with them because they had their own lake north of uh, brisbane okay um but <clears throat> money talks, so I ended up uh, staying in in uh, in America, in Florida, mm -hmm. which uh, this is maybe the only thing I regret, like decision-wise. If I would have gone there, I think my skiing would have taken a different direction, actually, because mm -hmm. they, you know, they they skied with Jeff Carrington. Yeah, he became world champion, and he came out to ski with us when I worked at Bensels and. Yeah, it would have been a bit different, but yeah. And obviously, Australia has an insane tradition of jump skiing, right? Yeah, so, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I could see how you know, maybe in retrospect, that could yeah. have been a different. So, so coming back to two thousand nine, I I did a, a feature for Water Ski Magazine. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, I've done a lot of photos, and uh, we'll get there. And then. <laughs> So I actually went to their site 20 years later, you know, I was yeah. supposed to go in 89, but I ended up going there in 2009. So it was kind of cool to, to see what I or missed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, was it a sour experience or was it a no, good experience? No, 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 no. It's, uh, it, it was just neat to see it. It was fun. Cool. It was fun. Cool. And, um, what, because eventually, you know, I've known you, I've known you for a long time, but I've never seen you jump or trick competitively. So eventually, those sort of faded away. Yeah. Um, what happened? Uh, well, jumping after ninety one worlds, I decided that I wanted to. Um, well, it was kind of because in ninety one I started working in Italy, and that decision was i wanted to take my skiing to another level i wasn't happy to be the best in sweden yeah so moving to italy and i remember getting that job or my biggest concern was if i could ski well ski well yeah there and i didn't even think about the fact that i didn't speak italian right. <laughs> that, was, that was the least on my mind yeah funny enough but uh and so yeah, going to Italy. So after 91 Worlds, I did well. And uh, then I went to America. And uh, I uh, already back then, I had hip problems. Ah. <clears throat> so I remember we spring in nine, 91, no, 92, we had a team training at Mike Schellander. So we were there for two two weeks. And I skied six times a day, two slalom, two tricks, and two jumps. And I could hardly walk down to the dock, but I still put my jump skis on and I jumped. Right. And coming into the jump, I just didn't have pressure on my right ski and hyperextended the knee on, on the jump. And I didn't tear my ACL all the way, yeah. but I tore it partially. And after that, I stopped for a while got a cti knee brace and then uh, i think after maybe maybe i i don't think it was that year a year after i started jumping again with the knee brace and it was at a tournament in in italy in sperlonga where i jumped and then i had to jump again and my knee brace was wet and i didn't get to tighten it as hard and then the next time out i hyperextended my knee on the jump again and i just i just felt my 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 knee yeah, yeah. so that was it so 
that whole summer i i just i didn't ski much and then at the end of the season i had surgery yeah my acl and then i get you know you can't be afraid jumping it was i mean you you have to have respect for it but you can't be afraid yeah. so slowly you know i tried but then hitting the jump feeling the knee a little bit and then that's how it slowly kind of faded away and i i still skied in the team for a couple of years maybe because of my trick skiing yeah and uh and it was fine tricking after the the acl i skied with the knee brace for a while and then i took that for the first year but then yeah that was fine i never really had much problems with my knee afterwards mm -hmm. so okay. actually yeah slow skiing a bit because I slow more back then. <laughs> After right. that, I, I right. started sk skiing a little more slow. But just my... Because they took my patella tendon mm -hmm. to do the ACL. And so I got a little inflamed or irritated. But yeah, no. Okay. So yeah, sort of like injury and then sort of like slowly... Yeah. Slowly and then trick skiing. To be honest, <laughs> it was... Uh, the boats changed. It was... Uh, and I don't want to throw any brand under the bus here, but the the Naughty came out with the one ninety six, and it was like it was like standing behind a cruise ship. It was so 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 much bubbles. Yeah, it's like for toe turns, it was terrible, and that was my strong thing: toe turns. Oh, you were oh okay. Yeah, I love toe turns. Nice. And so you know today. Everybody wants to do flip. I, I appreciate everything people do on a trick ski, but I, you know, if you're going to be a good tricker, you have to know your toe turns. You have to. Yeah. You have and, to. And uh, I hope they never take them away. I, I yeah, I know. It, today, I especially know that it's hard because I used to be good at it and I can't even hold my leg in today. It's... Right. I mean... what it, What is it... Why do you think you were better at that than saying hands? You just enjoyed it, or no? When I was uh, when I started <coughs> skiing, <laughs> I um, I tried a forty three inch Tech One Cypress Garden Tech One. I mean that was huge and I was small, but with this big ski, it was so easy to do toe, toe turns. Mm -hmm. But I mean for hand tricks, it was uh, it was. It was hard and I right. started using my upper body and stuff and plus with the big ski I could go slow right. with the speed and that also hurt my hand tricks. Mm -hmm. I, I, even at the end, I, you, you know, I still go slow hand tricks it's faster yeah. and I moved down to 41 inch trick ski eventually. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I think that that was the main thing with the wrong equipment when I started skiing. Because right. back in Sweden, no one really knew, you know. Yeah. No one really had the knowledge. Mm -hmm. But it sounded like you were coming to the U.S. quite a bit to... Um, well, after my first year of skiing in that club that I went to, the, Sweden, the best skier in Sweden skied there. Lars Björk, his son Andreas Björk became a really good jumper also. Yeah. And um he got people together to go to America to McCormick's. That was in 79, spring of 79, and he uh, you know, he got people together and then he could do his skiing for free so to speak if he brought people. And uh if he so he, I don't, I don't want to say that, I mean, he did it for himself so he could go there and get some, you know, free skiing. And so I went and uh, if I wouldn't have gone then in 79, I definitely wouldn't have gone the year after. The year after I went to Jack Travers. Okay. And uh, Anita Kalman was there and some other Swedes and then... Sammy Duvall skied with with Jack back then. Um, my case would Eddie Detelder, Belgium guy, Chantel uh, Sommer 
friend i think she was french it was a good environment oh i mean there's a picture there's a picture of me and this group in the water skier that was the awsa yeah you know from back then and yeah so cool that was cool and then after that i didn't get to go because i didn't do that well in school so ah well yeah school before skiing yeah i always tell the young kids today you know be good at school and you can be sure that anything you ask your parents they will do for you right if they can right and it's i mean i think it's pretty true i i don't have kids but uh you know no it sounds like a good rule you know it seems to be true yeah you know i know at least that when i did what i was supposed to do in school you know i will get a ski you know if i asked you know? <laughs> right yeah. And, uh, well, speaking of kids, you, you've done a fair amount of coaching in Italy over the years. Yeah, the first year in 91 <clears throat> that I came, I, I had, I think, 10, 10 kids that I had to, I was told that I had to be like a dad for them, take yeah. them to tournaments. And, you know, so I coached them and then we had this uh, minivan then, that I took them to the tournaments Mm -hmm. you know and uh yeah i did that for for the for this group for two years yep and um that was good fun there's some there's some good skiers actually really good skiers and you know as you know marco riva was one of them and he became european champion overall and uh, he got third overall also world in 2003 yeah, amazing skier. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, tricking was his thing. He won two I think he won three junior master titles, maybe. It's <laughs> insane. Or two or three. Yeah. And how was that? Cuz that was it sounded like it was your sort of like first coaching experience, no? Yeah, you know, when I when I made the Swedish team and when we did um team practice I could never I could never just ski and then sit on the bank and wait for my next ski ride. Right. So I always jumped in the boat. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um I don't know, I could I could never be quiet. I I had to say what I thought. Yeah. I maybe didn't necessarily know knew what I was talking about, but Right. I don't, I don't know. I just, I like to sit in the boat and look and maybe learn and, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that's how it started a little bit. So I wasn't totally, uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd gone to work in America before and, uh, so I'd worked ski school before. Yeah. So yeah but it sounds like you know being in the boat and having that urge of saying what you think was came from early on before you were a coach let's say yeah i i don't know i i uh i like to i like to help people yeah you know it's it's a awesome feeling just to be a part of uh helping people get better at the sport that i love you mm-hmm. know because <clears throat> it's my passion i mean it's it's my first love it's like it's what helped me get through tough times i mean i haven't had a lot of tough times but you know skiing is always what kind of kept me sane i think yeah i think a lot of us brings us insane and at the same time keeps us sane, <laughs> yeah, right? we're, we're we're a special breed you have to be a skier to know another skier i think yeah, you know, it's we true. ask ourselves why why do we do this, but you know, and you just gotta ask yourself. Yeah, and I think the the external person might not might not understand it at first. You know, like they see okay, outdoor sport next to the water. You know, beautiful bodies. You know, yeah. strong bodies. Um, but it, I think until you, especially in slalom, until you turn a buoy, you you're not quite getting it. You know. Yeah. And then you just have that feeling and you're hooked for life. I mean, slalom skiing, I don't, I probably didn't start to appreciate slalom skiing until 
much very late you know when i when i stopped jumping and stopped tricking i mean to run to run six buoys just having a nice flow through the course it's you know jumping is awesome also tricking is awesome they're all uh, probably jumping is the best okay i mean you've jumped you know just being out flying getting that second lift in the air and but even tricking learning a new trick for the first time and but slalom is i mean they're all up there yeah it's hard to pick one you can say what you think it's fine uh i mean <laughs> i we i wish i could i wish i could still trick mm -hmm. i mean i i, I uh, no i mean i wish i because in my head i i mean it's the it's your body that eventually says stop that's what you know really happen yeah so yeah and speaking of like the the picture of water skiing from above or like from away you know like how people get to ex be exposed to the sport obviously you were involved with the water ski magazine for mm -hmm. a long time yeah um with uh, a few wakeboard publications as well yeah um so i like to talk about that right i like you you know i would say without argument produce some of the best shots in toad sport industry so how did you start because you, you know everyone starts somewhere how did you start like your passion for photography and especially toad sport photography well uh, my first camera i got it i got from my dad and he just showed me very simple how he I mean, this was not a SLR camera by any means. I mean, it was an old camera. Yeah. Uh, basic point and shoot, but I could you could set aperture and and uh, and shutter, but I had no idea what it was. So, so it was like something in between. It's like he just showed me, and that's what I did. And I had this camera with me always when I traveled with skiing in the beginning so i mean i have tons of pictures back home you mm -hmm. know paper yeah yeah i have tons of them and um and i didn't realize until much later that this was a passion of mine right you know because um i um so i i i dated uh uh wakeboarder kathy williams who works at performance in mm -hmm. Orlando and um, I started taking photos of her to see if I could help her get exposure you know yeah. in 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 the magazine and uh, after a while I realized that my camera was or the lens was broken <laughs> and I remember that why it was broken because it's been run over by a car Oh, well, that, that will do it. <laughs> so, you know, you take it, you shake it. It's just kind of glass in there. So obviously the, the, the pictures didn't turn out sharp. And then, uh, so I went, I went uh, to buy a new lens. I went to the secondhand store and I ended up leaving with a new camera body. Mm -hmm. Still needed a lens. So I went okay. to buy a brand new lens uh canon 7200 because canon is the the camera that i used and so it just becomes yeah what you used to <clears throat> natural that you buy that same brand and uh yeah is it kind of like skiing like you you sort of stay stay with it it's what you know what you're familiar with uh yeah now nikon like when you zoom it turns the different way opposite way Ah, oh, okay. I can't remember whether it's turn uh, clockwise or counterclockwise when you zoom on the zoom lenses. But then you just get to know the camera, like where the buttons are, like, you know, right. interact with your camera. It's similar from model to model. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so after that, starting experiencing, got a wide angle lens and then i i got a housing for the camera and starting 
to ride in the tube while she was wakeboarding and yeah. you know and when i did that and i saw the pictures i was like whoa and i had changed film there's different back then it was slide film yeah you know this film that's they're more saturated and and when i saw it it's like i was blown away it was so cool i couldn't believe it like i did that <laughs> kind yeah. of thing and um that was the best with film like going picking it up after being developed like it was so exciting to see you know how it looked that was the best and yeah so it just went from there and i i remember taking pictures to world publication that's what it was called back then and uh, bill doster was the photo editor and he was looking at pictures and he's you know i guess he was kind it's like yeah it's not bad but okay not not good enough to be printed in the magazine and later i uh i realized that he was like yeah <laughs> you know that wasn't very good because you know as i became better i i could i could see myself that the early stuff wasn't where yeah. it needs to be how did you take him when he told you that Oh, I mean, I I just kept going, and um, I mean, after after a while, uh, Todd Ristercelli became was the editor for Water Skiing, and then he started looking at the pictures, and I mean, he was he was brutally honest, also. Right. You know, I it didn't come easy. I had to work for it for sure, and uh, there was a there was a time where. I I had put my housing. This was a new housing, with uh, where I could have a flash inside also. Ah. This was this is uh, a few years later, and I'd put it on my car. In the morning, going to take some pictures, and then I'm on the road, and I see something in my rearview mirror. Just flashing. And I was like, oh, what was that? And then I was like, no. I was like, oh, it was my housing flying off the car. No. Yeah. So I was devastated and I turned around, picked it up and I pretty much went straight to Winter Haven and had another one made that same day. Wow. And the guy, the English guy, I can't remember his name now. But he, he he was kind of pissed off with me <laughs> because, you know, it was his uh, art making yeah. these uh, water housings, you know, yeah. and I ruined it. But he he used some of the pieces and yeah. And um, so custom made, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. This guy done the housings for Tom King and Bill Doster and most of it was a lot of wakeboard photographers also. Yeah yeah okay first shot on the magazine first shot in the magazine um it was either christy overton at a from a world cup event at Richetto, just walking out of the lake mm -hmm. um after i think almost well she won but maybe close to world record or it was um, shot in wakeboard magazine it was actually a double page spread of brett eisenhower wow uh, on the on the rail that they put fire on and this was kind of this is you know it's a very good photographer joey medoc who's one of the best in wakeboarding he had set this shot up to do and i was there just watching and i had my camera and i took a picture and um, yeah i'm not very proud of this um showed it to wakeboard magazine and they liked it and they ran it and joey was the one who had set this up for with brett so yeah this is yeah I've never done anything like that after and uh, will never do it again. So mm -hmm. it was, it was, I apologized to him 
more than once and uh you know he was it wasn't i mean towards me he was cool about it but i'm sure he was pissed you know, off a little yeah, bit yeah. yeah for sure and so yeah but i guess we do make mistakes and realize you know like well as long as we can learn from them i guess exactly uh, so yeah Makes so that sense. was not but that that it was a good photo and maybe he had some photos also that he showed and just didn't come out as well i was just lucky basically hmm. i was lucky i i mean but it definitely fired me up to continue shooting wakeboarding yeah so yeah all right this is when me and thomas took a little break um i just wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone who's tuning in um sharing this podcast on social media and among friends and to all the people that have been sending emails of encouragement uh and just sharing their story about being on the water and getting people on the water well thank you so much if you want to support the podcast you can do so in a few ways you can get on apple podcast and leave a review you can tell your friends to subscribe and you can donate to the podcast if you wish to donate to the podcast some bucks or euros or whatever currency you want uh, you can go on thewaterskipodcast.com slash support and you'll find ways to donate to the podcast there um, sorry for the break back to the show all right well then how about first cover uh first cover was uh, Jody Fisher. Ooh, that's good. Mm. And um, it was, uh, I mean, it was kind of, I, I, I've shot a lot with Jody. It was because, um, like, I, so I started shooting, I think my first photo in the magazine was 99. And, um, at the time, I worked in Portugal. Mm -hmm. I was running my ski school there. And then uh, until 2003, my mom, she, she had a stroke in, the sp in May 2003. And I pretty much dropped everything and uh, drove home and uh, spent all summer in Sweden. I didn't ski much. I just basically skied the tournaments. Yeah, just slalom. And uh, at the end of that year, I was like, I didn't really know what to do, you know. And so I said, look, because I'd been home and it wasn't like I wanted to leave my mom because when it first happened, everybody was like, oh, your life's going to change because, you know, your mom, you know, she's going to have to have family around her and stuff because at first she was paralyzed right or all, all all paralyzed and then slowly got some movement back and then you know not everything yeah but so at the end of i can't remember if it was fall or spring of 2004 i was like i i gotta i gotta get out of here you know, mm -hmm. not to leave my mom alone, but you know, I have my sister at home also. So, and I said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to try this photography thing, see if I can, you know, take it to another level. Right. And so I came over there and, uh, I ran into Jody and, uh, Nicola Huntridge. Mm -hmm. They were together at that time. I ran into them at performance and uh, I was like, oh, hi, how are you doing? And they were asking me what I was doing here. And I pretty much said, I wanted to see if I can do this thing with photography. They asked me, where are you staying? I'm like, I don't really know. <laughs> right. I, I, I was staying with uh, Doug Ross for a couple of nights because I'd stayed with him there, I think the year before or something. But I was thinking, I'm going to just go in a extended stay hotel or something right and they say hey why don't you come and stay with us so i went and stayed with them at the trailer or where annie maple did all of his skiing yeah you know 
and uh yeah helped jody out drive the boat a little bit and then you know he was basically my guinea pig hmm. you know so shot a lot of stuff with him and uh yeah and we we i think it was i just i, I mean i had no idea i left some photos at the magazine and then it was, it was a big surprise to me that I had the cover. Wow. <laughs> it was cool, though. It was a good shot. Really good shot. Okay. Do you remember, what, was the, what was the scene? What were you guys... Uh, I, it was shot at Lake Hancock. Mm -hmm. And I shot from another boat with a ladder down. And it was uh, his... Off, yeah, his... Uh, his uh, righty, lefty, righty. It was, it was 1305 ball. Yeah. So I from a different he's, boat. He's a lefty, yeah. Jody? Uh, you're, you're testing my memory right now. Oh, I'm feeling. Let me look it up. Let me look it up. But I'm, it, I'm sure it was, it was the one, it was his uh, 135 side though. I know that. Because of where the boat was? Well, yeah. But also... I know, I, I mean, this is something that I learned eventually, like uh, when they do covers, they, they, they wanted the turn to go that way on the cover because of the way you open up the magazine. No way. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that you learn after a while. You know, if you shoot a horizontal picture, you cannot have the skier in the middle because that will be the middle of the magazine. You have this uh, line. Uh huh. I mean, sometimes you do it there, but you know, sometimes you want to try to place the skier or on the right side or the left side, or maybe it was more with wakeboarding that I did that because you have the rider in the on the right side, and then you have the boat on the left side. Right. You know, and. Uh, if you didn't do that, maybe the shop would just be a half page. Ah, uh, okay. And so, like, it's uh, you're strategizing you know, with the yeah, angles. Yeah, you, you, you know, if it's if it's a good horizontal shot, then uh, you know, the bigger the bigger the page, the more money you make. Yeah, but <laughs> of course, uh, I'm guessing those are the trick of the trades you need to learn, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Jody, right foot forward. Um, yeah. So he was his offside. And he always, he always had good facial expression. You know, a guy can be a little, uh, you know, yeah. as the women, they have to be pretty, I guess. Right. <laughs> it helps. I mean, they're all, they're all pretty, but like, you know, when, when it comes to skiing, uh, it's just, I don't know, a guy can, it's not, I mean, it comes out the wrong way here. <laughs> you Let's know. tease it out. But, you know, the people like to see pretty women and, uh, and, and the women, they also like to look good if yeah. they're going to be in print. Yeah. Sometimes it gets maybe a bit too cheesy when they smile, but, you know, some, some, sometimes that's what sold. And so, you know, I, I guess I, told them hey well definitely keep your eyes open smile or you know be relaxed and you try to coach them a little bit how yeah and you know what to wear now when it comes to you said you know jody was kind of like your guinea pig that's what you're sort of like a little bit yeah i mean i i i mean i have this one contraption that i built that was uh, i mean it's ridiculous thinking about the compared to the today when you have a GoPro, right? So I I I, I built this thing. It was kind of a, a cage okay. that he put on like a life jacket, and then above his right shoulder, I had a I had a I made a special water housing mm -hmm. where I put my camera in, where I had a remote, and. Um, because I wanted to, I wanted to have a picture from his point of view. Right. I mean, this thing was heavy. Yeah, that. I can't believe he actually ran the course with it. 
Okay, that heavy. Yeah. A Wade Cox put it on too. I don't know if he managed to run the course. He might have. And then then I was in a, a second boat following to push the remote. Right. Because it, it didn't reach that far back then. Right. So I had to add two boats. So Jody was skiing with a cage in a cage while you were in a boat next to him, pretty yeah. close, I'm assuming. Yeah. I have I have some pictures of it somewhere. I nice. Need, I need to pull it out. Nice. So I'm standing up and I'm trying to, you know, when I wanted the the photo to be taken, you know, after the turn kind of thing. Yeah. I can't I can't remember if it was ever printed something like that. I know that David Small barefooter he used it also barefooting which I was like scared but I mean he was like yeah this is nothing because barefoot I mean if you fall with that thing you're gonna get hurt yeah but I mean him barefooting just behind the boats like yeah. walking for us so but it, that 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 was printed I had I had uh, two wakeboarders wear it also oh wow yeah Wow, so those were, those were like mid two thousands, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, two thousand, yeah, two thousand five, two thousand four, two thousand five, and it was it was still film back then, so that was even harder, you know. I I I didn't know how it turned out until I, I picked up the film. Right. So. I mean, Did you to, ever develop film yourself? No. No yeah no i never never studied anything i'm self-taught mm -hmm. and uh, yeah i just learned from i bought some not books well soft soft uh, book books with pictures yeah with pictures that it said what aperture and what shutter speed what film and what iso basically Mm -hmm. so i saw that and i was like okay i'm gonna try that okay and that's <clears throat> that's kind of how i i uh, um got in or got into i mean using flash a lot because i guess a lot of people know me for my flash photography like mm -hmm. sunrise or sunset stuff yeah that's what i kind of became known for and i got passionate about like the colors and stuff and uh i kind of learned it by by coincidence looking at a picture in this magazine sewing the saw this extreme settings okay and i just went out i i'm i remember exactly when it happened it, it was uh it was uh i was shooting a wakeboarder here in orlando it was like a couple of days before Christmas. It was super warm. I was in a tube and this photo just came out sick. I was like, whoa, so cool. Because yeah. it's really slow shutter speed and you have these uh, ghost uh, shadows. Mm -hmm. and, and then the flash just freezing the action. And, and uh, that it got printed. And then I think a couple of days later, I went to try the same stuff skiing mm -hmm. with Doug Ross and Seth Stisher. Yeah. And the shots came out unreal. And um, that technique that I don't know if I want to say I developed, but that's I just kept that that I kept shooting like that for. I mean, I'll shoot like that even today. So. Right. And and I have I know people. I don't know. It just seemed so easy after that. Right. Uh, it's. Uh, I had people ask me, "How do you do it?" And I mean, obviously, I didn't really. They show. They told me what they were doing, and uh, I mean, I didn't really tell them because it was my secret. Even though it wasn't a secret, because I thought it was very obvious how to do it. But when they, when they. Uh, showed me their settings i was like wow they're way off yeah so yeah i'm guessing there's a bit of like you know learning settings um 
trying to you know get inspired by other pictures you look at like pictures of like outside of skiing or wakeboarding you look at other sports for inspiration non-sports pictures no of course you you um i mean the the this magazine i can't remember now but of course yeah i mean uh, the 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 way i take those evening shots sunset shots would be the same way i would take a picture of uh, a couple in front of a sunrise or sunset okay it's not going to change much mm -hmm. actually and um yeah so in those like days where you were like sort of like using Jody as a guinea pig what were you learning were you learning angles were you learning how to get ideas for shots like what were you learning in those early days I don't know if it was so much uh I mean obviously you learn all the time it was just I just wanted to shoot pictures ah. I I just you know I, I guess I you know and this is I was lucky in the way because I, I mean, I've known Jody since he was 11 yeah. and all these pros today, I know them before photography. I knew them through skiing. So whenever I call them and say, Hey, you want to shoot or you want to try this? They, they, uh, they said, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, I realized that today like if i wanted to if i want to go and sh shoot surfing or whatever and i call up the world champion he's like who are you right i mean you know because i'm not his friend yeah so you, it's not always what you know it's who you know yeah and so but i i do i used everyone just to shoot and shoot and shoot and and they were happy to do it because you know they had never you know been shot and haven't had their photo print their shot printed in the magazine and then eventually they you know they knew there was a fairly big chance that they get their shot printed yeah but then and also like angles because i'm a skier i think that's helped me a lot mm -hmm. you know i i know where to be even though i've been in a some spots where i shouldn't have been <laughs> right but not not too often you know it's been yeah. i've had some close calls but uh, the fact that i know how it works definitely has helped yeah and also be actually also being a coach i mean you know just comes into my mind i, I showed with trent finlayson at one one time and um his offside no it was his own side and as he turned he he turned his head to the left and i said i made a comparison with will, will asher you know how he finished a turn and it looks like he's looking down at uh, a four ball when he turns two ball yeah and i just said that to trent and he's like oh yeah, yeah. and so next shot he did that and boom and that got printed Wow. So I was, I'm kind of like coaching them at the same time, yeah. you know, and uh, someone that wouldn't have been a skier wouldn't have known to say that. Right. No, like, I sure. mean, I, so it's certainly helped me, I think. Yeah. Because you know, like, you know what you want to see on the picture, yeah. but you also know what movements are allowed and not allowed to yeah. ask to a skier. Yeah. Right. So when, when I edit my pictures, I don't only look if they're sharp, you know, and yeah. the face and the eyes are open, whatever. I look for good technique and good style. That's cool. So, you know, it might be perfect picture, but you know, it's just, no, because as this, as a skier, you don't want to be, you want to be portrayed the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, you want to look good. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so, you know, I, yeah. So, I mean, I, I was trying to help them also look good. Of course. You know? 
Yeah, no, which is something that you, you're not necessarily concerned when you're skiing. Like you have other worries, right? Like oh, you're yeah, trying yeah, to catch yeah, yeah. buoys, you're trying to. Yeah. Um, what is uh, so obviously the magazine hasn't been around now in two or three years, right? It's been three yeah, years. Yeah, it's uh, what is it? It's little. Old. Is it two years? Yeah, it's gone quick, but yeah, two years at least. What kind of change was that? You know, like uh, maybe for you personally and for the sport. I mean, for the sport, I think it's it's not good. <laughs> right. Definitely needs need a magazine. I think it's uh, yeah. Why? I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know. Just to, I mean, for for the, I think for the pros, for you know, like to get to get their faces out there. Sure, there's the internet, but the, I mean, the the magazine towards the end was uh, was uh, like you could download it and look at it on your iPad also. But I don't know. It's just. I don't have the answers, but I don't know. I mean, obviously, I I I loved the being creative and take photos, and you know that was a channel for me to show to show my stuff, but also to show the world how cool our sport is, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, it's just one less channel that shows it. I mean, today there's social media. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I miss the magazine. Yeah, no, and a lot of people do. And I think for me, at least, it's a lot of like, like I can't touch a shot online. No, I, I want to, you know? I love holding a magazine. Yeah, it's a different, different experience. Yeah, no, I, I like it. To see it printed is, uh, good satisfaction yeah for sure think, and yeah it's right it's a different kind of achievement right like you can like i'm thinking about it um like say you, as you know i'm doing a phd and you know part of the goal is to publish scientific yeah. research and you technically get your article online when it's accepted and you've gone through the process before it's printed but there's a definition for it it's ahead of print yeah right and then authors really get pumped when it gets printed and it gets sent to the people that subscribe to that yeah. that particular journal um i mean it's there forever yeah like if you if you if you write a book or something yeah and, book is the same you know, music is the same yeah. you know i think the vinyl resurgence yeah. is because people want to see it there like that's that's my music yeah you know i mean i i, I have this idea i've had it forever to maybe do a coffee table book you know because please it, do i have so many photos that never been seen and gone to print and you know it'd be kind of cool it's becoming your own editor almost <laughs> yeah no i mean it, it'd be it'd be nice so well let me know when you do we're gonna promote it here you know it'd be cool yeah yeah no it's uh i'd love i'd love to do it it's probably nothing that will it won't make you money but it's it's just it's kind of need to have something yeah you know you remember yeah because maybe that's what maybe that's the whole thing right like maybe digital actually without the maybe digital saves a lot of cost up front yeah right but um but it's different no it's it really for sure different. it's different for sure it's different you know I hope it comes back. I doubt that it will. How come? What do you think? I don't know. It's just this big corporation. It's just about money, you know? Yeah, I know. But, you know, like, I wonder because I, in a few in people that I interviewed, like, we spoke about it with Marcus. We spoke about it with Chris. Like, and you talk about it with skiers. In the last two or three years, it seems like skiing, there's a bit of a resurgence, you know, there's more pro tournaments. It seems like more people are skiing. Ski schools are busy. Yeah. Maybe um, the market is there. I mean, the core skiers are always going to keep skiing. 
to make it grow. Yeah, I mean, a wakeboarding is definitely taking a step back, I think. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it's expensive also, the wakeboarding with the boats and stuff. I mean, skiing is not cheap either. Right. It's like it's like snowboarding, uh, snow skiing. It's uh, snow skiing is doing uh doing good yeah. again. So. Yeah, but I, I anyway. I mean, like the photography is just you know showing showing the sport, showing how cool it is. That was my main thing. I think the whole time to to just get the coolest possible picture to have you know the wow. I wanted pictures like wow that's cool yeah you know and uh i mean yeah a couple of shots maybe were like that <laughs> okay i mean there's there's a lot of good photographers out there that have done some really nice f- photos i still have some ideas that i would i never got to do mm-hmm. maybe maybe one day i get to do them okay so I, the last time i shot it was with Corey Vaughn and uh, I mean I, I was trying to get him on the cover and then like a month later the magazine was done and Freddie Freddie Winter he was injured at the moment he was driving the boat and when he saw the picture he's like no he was he was jealous <laughs> oh, yeah. so I'm gonna have to I told him I'm gonna have to do some shots with him okay <laughs> get uh, my flashes out what are your Maybe it's a good way to conclude this. What are your top three shots? The ones that when you look back again now, you're like, wow. You know, like it gives you that wow moment, you know? Well, I mean, I have one shot of Freddy Krueger that was, uh, it was printed and it's, it's not an easy shot. I mean, I don't know, luck. So I was shooting him jumping and uh, Karen, she said, look at the full moon. But the full moon was behind the jump. Like he was jumping one way and he was jumping away from the moon. Yeah. So I was like, okay. So I did a double exposure. It's where the film doesn't move forward. You take a picture. So I took a picture of the moon with a different lens. Mm-hmm. And then I put a wide angle lens on and then Freddie jumped and you have one chance. Right. It was film. I had no idea. I had no idea. Yeah. You don't know until you go and pick it up. Yeah. And it was spot on. I mean, it was. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, so he just comes off the jump and you have a big full moon there. So it's, <sighs> it's, it's, and, and that's what I, that's what I liked also about the 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 film because what you get is when you know is what what comes out is what you get. It's no Photoshop. It's you know. It's what it is. It, exactly, it is what it is, and even today with digital, that's how I think. That's how I want. You know, I can I can show you pictures that people are like. Oh yeah, that must be photoshopped. Right. And I'm like. I can show you the raw file and it looks pretty much exactly the same. Right. But okay, so Freddy, that's a shot. So you sort of operate, even with digital, you operate as if you had that shot only. Yes. Oh, that's that's a, a good challenge that you're putting on yourself. Yeah. I mean, so back then with with film, I, I use filters a lot. I had I remember I had this one filter, a, a sunset filter. I used a lot. People were always ask me, how can you always get these colors? Right. And uh, so, but with digital, you know, I don't, I hate. Yeah, I guess I, I cheat a little bit. Then you can put that filter on afterwards in Photoshop. Right. And so. That's a little bit of it cheating, but I I I, I did uh, a photo of Jason McClintock, which uh, became a cover. It was a silhouette photo. It's all blue, and I showed some people just the other day. I showed the raw file, and then it's uh, 
it's digital yeah it's uh it's not photoshop it's the and 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 i i so with the digital cameras you can actually choose some settings it's a setting it's um it's a tungsten when when you have tungsten light indoors mm -hmm. you have to when you shot film you have to use a different film okay otherwise the color it gets too warm so mm -hmm. the colors get balanced difference with tungsten film and when you shoot with that film outdoors everything becomes blue uh -huh. so with the digital camera i can set it up as i was shooting that type of film and i put a blue filter on right. so it, it gets even deeper blue mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so that's how i shot that cover and it was like i was shooting film right interesting and uh, yeah so but yeah i have a i have a shot of uh, thomas de gasperi that no one's ever seen that it came out crazy it was it was with flash and uh, the spray is all red and during that shot one of the flashes that was supposed to lit him up didn't work mm -hmm. and so it became a silhouetted shot and that shot would, was printed so the the shot that i went to do never got published but the mistake got published <laughs> but so this is like a shot that you know it's it's maybe not the coolest angle or stuff like that but just knowing what went behind it as far as the pick the the flashes and you know right moment and stuff not easy a lot of people involved um uh, i was happy i was very happy with that shot but there's there's quite a few it's hard to pick one well that's probably why you're struggling with the coffee table book you can just choose right yeah it's uh, that that will be hard to to edit to get it down but i think sure. as you said like uh, it might not be the style of a coffee table book, but also throwing in the story that went behind the shot, I think it's a completely different yeah, experience. Yeah, you know? my idea is it's going to be just photos, but some of the shots definitely have uh, some stories behind it. <laughs> this, yeah, this one, one time, with, and this is Jody again. Yeah. We... Um, it was this canoe that I, I, I went to buy hay bombs, like uh, hay. Ah, uh, hay bomb, yeah. And I put that in the canoe and we tied the canoe behind the buoy. Okay. And then we lit the thing on fire. <laughs> All right. And then I knew that I had one shot at it. Yeah. You know. Didn't buy enough hay. No, no, but I had one shot because as as he turns through the buoy, he's going to spray the canoe that's ah, right. put on lit on fire. Ah, right, right, right. And that's then true. It's going to go out. So I have one one shot. Yeah. And actually the shot he used the shot because Jody used to do this calendar that yeah. he gave with the sponsor. So the shot's been seen. But the story is uh, is kind of funny <laughs> so we did that and after the first one the the canoe kind of started tipping over okay it was still on fire so i mean he kept skiing and i kept taking pictures and then smokes it started to smoke <laughs> yeah and and then after a while by the house there's there's some fire trucks and we're like <laughs> so we we just you know and then they disappeared so we okay. we just we got our stuff together and and just went back in yeah this was a lake hancock okay and uh and then when we were in we saw the fire trucks at the aisles of lake hancock okay because they were just building it then and and I, I mean I, I i went inside i hide in the corner <laughs> I, I was shitting myself right and, and then a helicopter came wow with searchlight okay and i mean i saw this searchlight on the grass 
coming closer and closer to where we are and just went under under the roof and then left and then police came wow yeah <laughs> i was and then eventually jody he he uh, decided to go up to the police and um, i was i was five feet behind him <laughs> <laughs> and uh he he went uh, yeah we we um we're the one that was uh, out there on the lake or shooting and and the police goes i found the perpetrators <laughs> and then they responded back well just tell them to to let us know next time they have to do something like this you know i'm like <laughs> wow wow <laughs> oh man i'm telling you did you do it again no <laughs> what <laughs> but um two fire trucks helicopter police it was uh, better uh, be a good shot i mean yeah it was a good shot we got it Sweet. it was on film it wasn't digital so it's film so nice but like i said you had one try yeah a lot of lot of reason why that one was a one try yeah. it was film it was fire that went off yeah wow and so i mean if you ever been you should actually i'm not gonna tell people to go inside the buoy but if you i've had people with me inside the buoy just yeah. to experience and you know it goes pretty fast it does when you're 36 miles an hour and you have to follow you know yeah and yeah. the closer you are to the buoy the quicker it is the further away the more time you have it's yeah. easier to follow yeah so now I, i've experienced that like as some shot i wasn't taking the shot because i'm i'm completely incapable of doing that but i was holding a flash right so I was holding the flash inside the buoy where the photographer was taking the, the picture. Oh, okay, yeah. So I was even a little bit further away. And sure enough, it's, you know, it gives you a good sense of how fast we are when we do what we do. I, talk, I, I, I talked to Chris Paris the other day because he was actually one of the first people that I shot with inside the buoy oh. at his home lake, uh, Lake Pickett. And uh, I, th I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. I was, I think I was pretty close and he, I don't know if he, what rope length he was on, but I remember him hitting the buoy and it just made a noise and it scared me. <laughs> right. Man. So, but you and I, we've shot. Yeah, we've shot together. Yeah. yeah. We've shot together. I know the experience. That's good. Yeah. The one more thing. Yeah. The one more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 20 second gate one, two. Uh, one, uh one more okay yeah. sounds good yeah I but guess, i like that i guess i'm famous for that one yeah. more that we will if you ask will asher <laughs> if he if, if you say my name that's probably what he will think of one more well other people too but i mean i think it's good it shows that you're serious about your your work and you want to get the right shot yeah i mean yeah i'm 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 a bit of a perfectionist yeah with well. with a lot of things i do I think and creative people are. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, they are. They are. They and and there's times where I already have the shot. I don't tell the people. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but there was one time uh, shooting for uh, radar, and uh, uh, can't remember who the skier was, but I kept kept going, kept going, and then after that, Trent went goes out and first first turn i'm like okay i got it <laughs> stopped <laughs> and trent's like looked at this other skiers like see that's how you do it <laughs> yeah you just you just one and done yeah. you know but it's happened before but you know but i have them just to be sure maybe yeah. maybe i can get something better yeah so mm -hmm. why don't we conclude with uh, some advice right because i i see a lot of people, not, not a lot of people, but I do see people that are passionate about photography mm -hmm. and they want to become better at taking good shots, right? Some, some advice that you would have. Well, if you, it depends what, ca if you have a SLR camera where you can, you have a manual setting, you need, you need to understand the, the relationship between shutter and aperture. Okay. 
You know, I remember when I started being a Ricetto, there's this one photographer is shooting a lot of the team skiers now asking him questions and I it just went in here and out there. I didn't understand anything. Right. But it's actually quite simple. But it's like with everything, you know. If you you look at other people, wow. But one, once you know your your trade or whatever it is, it's not that hard. You just, if you want it, and you just take a book and read it. On, or it's not, it, I mean, it's not like you have to read a whole book. Yeah. But uh, the shutter speed and the aperture is important because it decides how much light comes in and hits the film or, or the sensor. Yeah. And with with skiing, you have to have a higher shutter speed to freeze the action. But if you have a a small, I don't know if I get this right now, but a small aperture where uh, you have the aperture, yes, yeah, sm small aperture where you don't let in enough light and a fast shutter speed it's going to be dark so you have to open it up with a faster shutter speed and that's why you have you have some lenses they're called prime lenses where you can open up and they they will let in a lot of light even if the conditions are bad mm -hmm. but today also the cameras today the digital cameras the iso back then like even today i shoot with maybe a iso 250 400 which back when there was film you used like 400 for indoors okay where it's darker and with flash but today digital cameras they they're they're like 50,000 iso or 100,000 and you don't even get grain you, mm -hmm. you don't so like you shoot a wedding you don't have to use flash or events where the flash become irritated mm -hmm. indoors. So I'm not now I'm not giving much advice here, but <laughs> <laughs> you, you just got to play around. But the basics, you got to learn the basics. You got to learn to use manual setting, yeah. not automatic. Right. If you just do a, a snapshot, sure, that's fine. But if you if you want to be creative, you have to learn uh, the 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 similarity and also lastly uh, I, I i bought some flashes when i started from this french photographer florent carman mm -hmm. who's a barefooter and a very good photographer and he said to me once you learn how to use a flash you will never stop and that was very true for me when when i learned to use a flash i used the flash almost all the time now I'm using less flash now. Now I, I, I really like natural lighting and yeah, you know, backlit where everything's blown out in the background. But it's you go through phases. But <clears throat> you have to learn how to use your camera in manual setting, mm -hmm. and then yeah, just gotta play around. Find skiers that are willing to yeah, take those yeah. shots. Yeah, but you know, don't go inside the buoys unless you know what you're doing. Yeah you know definitely and it has to be a skier that is a good skier i i I've, I've been i've put myself in bad situations and yeah yeah i've been lucky okay so well any other thoughts anything that you want to say that we didn't say i have a lot to say no <laughs> <laughs> it'll be another time maybe no yeah, but we it, can do it again it's all good i i i i think this what you're doing is awesome I've listened to a few of them and it's it's very good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we'll do e another one. Everything that can, uh, you know, put water skiing out there in in the limelight and get people stoked about this sport is good. Sweet. So, well, I keep trying. Yeah, yeah. I th I think yeah, and uh, we have to we have to help each other, support each other, and you know, it's a small community. We just gotta st stay united. Yeah for it to grow good point yeah so well thanks thomas this was fun i appreciate it yep that's good cheers bam allora e dici Do 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 do
Thank you.